Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining our webinar this morning. Um, so my name is Nathan McCauley. I'm the director of security over here at Docker. Um, manage the security team and I'm kind of uh, pretty, pretty excited to share with you some of the stuff that we're going to be um, – some of the stuff we're going to be talking about today is, is uh, pretty cool. So I want to go ahead and uh, jump right into it. Um, looking at looking at slide two, um, what what we've recently rolled out and we want to share with you a little bit today is Docker security scanning. Uh, you may have heard about this previously as Project Nautilus if you've been following kind of our development and some of the announcements we made at DockerCon. And so uh, previously Nautilus and what is now called Docker security scanning is essentially a detailed image security analyzer. What it does is it opens up your images and takes a look at if there's any known vulnerable content within the image. If it finds some, it enables notifications and what we call proactive security for organizations who are um, using the Docker security scanning capability. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but just to, to give an overview of availability and what it's, what's integrated with. Um, right now, we're running a limited time free trial for Docker Cloud private repo customers. So anyone on Docker Cloud who has a private repo can spin it up, try it out today, and start scanning their images. Over the rest of the year, you'll see it roll out to our Docker data center customers, and then eventually to all of the Docker Cloud repo users across, the, um, across all of Docker Cloud. To give an idea of the scale, we've already secured 400 million pulls of the official repos in the last six months. What I mean by that is we've been running Docker security scanning against the official images to weed out any security vulnerabilities that might have been in those and get those patched up and good to go and um, have seen a, a great number of organizations computer security improved based on that. In addition to that, kind of as, a, as an additional uh, plus one tidbit, we've updated the Docker bench utility to be based on the latest updates from the Docker 1.11 benchmark that was released by the Center for Information Security. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that, but um, so kind of two, two things we want to talk about today. Uh, looking at slide three, as an overview, I want to kind of talk about and set some context about what we're, what we're going to be talking about and what components are made up of in the, the Docker security strategy, if you will. And we really view it as three pillars across the whole software supply chain. The first pillar is secure platform. And what we mean by secure platform is we want to put, provide a place to run your applications that has strong isolation and is secure by default. The additional pillar beyond secure platform is secure content. What we mean by secure content is having trust over the content that you're running. This come down, comes down to two questions. Those questions are, who created the content and how good is it? Is it created by a trusted developer and does it have any vulnerabilities? The third pillar that we want to focus on is secure access. What we mean by secure access is basically when you have infrastructure interfacing with an organization, you must have access control policies and rules that you can apply such that administrators can do the job that they need to do and developers themselves can do what they need to do. And so you kind of see that the goal here is to marry the needs of developers and IT operations. Developers are able to be creative, develop their software, and do it as quickly as they can. As, as fast as they want to go, they're, they're going to be enabled by that. In addition, they're going to be brought into the secure development lifecycle in a way that is meaningful and helpful to them. For the IT operations folks, they want to provide flexible and granular controls. They want to be able to say who's allowed to do what where, and they want to implement what we call proactive risk management. So our hope is that as Docker is securing the software supply chain, we're able to have both developers and the IT operations folks have a good experience and 
be enabled to do their uh, workflows better. So that's a little bit about the Docker security story. On slide four, I want to talk a little bit about the overall Docker vision. And just to, just to set context for the, the rest of the things we're going to be talking about, Docker's goal is to provide a basically containers as a service implementation for modern software supply chains. What do we mean by that? Well, we split it into three phases. Those phases are build, ship, and run of applications. Developers build their applications on their development machines, sign those images, and upload them to a registry. Once they're uploaded by the registry, a IT operations team can pull that down and then run that application in production in any environments where it's needing to be run, orchestrated, scaled, managed, and updated. So that's the context for overall what Docker is trying to do. I want to jump a little bit into the specifics of how Docker security is trying to roll out across those pillars that I talked about earlier. And the first pillar I want to talk about on slide five is secure platform. What do we mean by secure platform? As I said before, it's about isolation, strong guarantees, and strong defaults. So very proud to say that over the, over the past year, we've gotten to the point now where Docker has support for every Linux kernel isolation primitive that exists. Namespaces, set comp, LSMs, cap dropping, whatever it is, we have support for all of it. But we've taken that actually one step further. In addition to having support for it, we have out-of-the-box default settings and profiles for all of these features. Whether it's a default set comp policy that limits which syscalls can be called to default set of capabilities that are dropped when you're inside a container, we've done all the work to figure out reasonable defaults across the board. But for some folks, they want to go even further. They want further fine-grained access control and policies say they want to limit even further what syscalls are allowed within a particular container image, that's totally possible. So we provide these default policies. We've done the work to figure out those default policies that apply to basically any microservice architecture that's running inside a Docker container. But if you want to go further deep down, that's, Paul. that's fine by us, and Docker will support you in doing that. So overall, what this comes to is a secure by default runtime environment. What's Interesting about that is it is very much the case today that you can take any application, put that application inside of a Docker runtime, and inherit for free just a ton of Linux kernel isolation features that will limit and constrain what that application can do down to a reasonable default. And you get that just out of the box by putting it inside of Docker, and so we're, we're pretty happy about just the security win of going from no Docker to running inside of Docker. In addition to providing a secure and isolated runtime environment, um, another thing that's very important is to properly configure your Docker daemon. There's a lot of daemon settings that have to do with um, enabling, enabling policies, enabling certain frameworks. And so we've worked with the Center for Information Security to write a fairly extensive document called the Center for Information Security Docker 1.11 Security Benchmark. And what that document is is about um, over 100 page documents on best practices for running Docker, the Docker engine. So to many people, a 100 page document can be a little bit much to digest. So what we've done is created a tool that checks your configuration against all those best practices. This tool is called Docker Bench. It's a basically shipped as a container that can run on your hosts and give you a line-by-line -line set of recommendations on how well you're following the recommendations from the benchmark document. So we've recently updated this based on Docker one, Engine 1.11. The previous version had been based on 1.6. So there's a lot of good new stuff in there, so we recommend people update, or if you're not using it yet, go ahead and start using that. Moving on to slide seven. 
Another thing that we're announcing today that we're pretty excited about is Docker security scanning. Docker security scanning, as I said earlier, is about providing deep visibility into container images. So effectively what we do is scan every layer by layer within a Docker image. We actually go one level deeper to look at every file in the container layers and to see if any of them have known vulnerable software. So this is in two phases. Basically we generate what we call a bill of materials. The bill of materials lists what packages are installed, what frameworks are installed, what libraries are installed based on a bottom-up scan, not based on any metadata store, but actually generated by code that we run that looks through the container. And we cross-reference that bill of materials against known CVE databases, known vulnerability databases, such as national vulnerability database, and provide notification services to let you know, hey, this image that you updated or uploaded may have vulnerability in it, we found a vulnerable component, or, hey, this piece of software that you're running out in your infrastructure, it has vulnerability, you may want to go update it and patch that issue. I'm pretty excited about the tie-ins that this has to Docker Content Trust, where not only can you scan the images, but then you can implement secure signing and verification workflows on top of that. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But before I do that, I want to jump into what this, the scanning service itself looks like. So on slide eight, we kind of covered this a little bit. What it looks like is a Docker developer from their workstation will upload an image to the Docker cloud. When an image gets uploaded to the Docker cloud or to a, a registry, once we roll it out across more of the product set, that image will get sent over, a notification will get sent over to the Docker security scanning service, which will kick off a bunch of scans. What I mean by that is that the scanner has what we call a plug-in framework. So new scanners can be plugged in. Right now we have some very good scanners that provide um, scanning over um, system libraries and some first-party libraries as well, but we, can, we expect to continue to grow that over time to support more languages and more frameworks, stuff like that. So each of the plugins gets a chance to contribute to what we call that build materials database. Anything that they find gets plugged into the build materials database, and we do two very important things with that build materials database. The first thing is just display it to the user, just to let the user know, hey, here's what we found in your image. For many folks, this is a big deal because they're able to see layer by layer, component by component, what is in their image. For many people, that's a big deal. But in addition to that, we have this notification service that notifi notifies the developers or any IT operations folks who might be interested in knowing that there is a vulnerability in one of the repos that they're associated with. So pretty cool service. Um, we've got this rolled out right now, but as we rolled it out, we had a few questions that we kind of asked ourselves that we're hearing from customers about what they wanted to solve in terms of content security. So in slide nine, we kind of talk about what some of those questions are, and then we'll go on to show how we've answered those questions. So the first couple of questions are about on a container by container basis, on an image by image basis, what are the kind of questions you want to answer kind of in isolation in just one container? So one question is, what's inside my container? In addition to that, how do I know where this code came from? So generally, who and what? Who created this container and what is it? You want to know that kind of for every container. Jumping up a higher level in an organization, what kind of questions do you want to answer? In an organization, the kind of questions you want to answer is, how do I keep my team safe from bad components? How do I make sure vulnerable software isn't getting introduced in the first place and kind of prevent that and cut it off the head before it ever gets rolled out. But equally as important, how do I stay on top of patches? Because as we all know, it is a reality today 
that we're all running software that has vulnerabilities that get disclosed, and then we need to start a patch process. So how do I stay on top of that? How do I do that quickly? How do I prove to a compliance and governance auditor that I'm doing a good job of managing that? For, for many folks, that's an equally important question to answer. And in general, how do I not make this a giant pain for everybody involved? So on slide 10, we kind of talk about how we think this looks before and after Docker's rollout. So to hear your feeling for what this looks like for many organizations, the patching process for updating vulnerable software is atrocious. In many cases, there are cumbersome tools that in many cases fail to actually patch. A lot, of, a lot of times when you try to patch some base system component that is used across the entire infrastructure, that update will fail. In addition, it's a reactive and slow process. For many organizations, I've, I've talked to many of these folks, what this actually looks like is subscribe to a bunch of mailing lists, subscribe to a particular set of people on Twitter, and then basically hope that you get notified that there is some vulnerability that you need to patch. Worse than that, once you figure out that there is a vulnerability that you need to patch, you don't have a way to go find it within your infrastructure because of how big the infrastructure is, how sprawling it is. A lot of times it's hard to know where that vulnerable software might be within the infrastructure. In addition, before Docker, applications do not travel with their dependencies. Applications and dependencies only get bound once you actually end up on a host. And so looking at, say, a Ruby on Rails or Java application, you can't necessarily tell if it's insecure or not because you don't know what version of the JVM it's on or what version of Ruby is going to be running on top of. So it becomes hard to reason about this uh, because the only time we actually know is when it's actually on a host itself. Finally, in many organizations, security is siloed off from dev, from development and application operations. So there's three teams that need to come together to work together. They don't necessarily have an integrated workflow that helps them. So let's look at this, what, what this looks like after Docker and Docker security scanning's integration into the Docker component workflow. Number one, you are much more likely to succeed at updates with Docker. And the, the primary reason is because Docker applications travel along with their dependencies. You can do an isolated build and know that if you've updated a piece of software, it works on your laptop, works in staging, it will work in production, and an update to that will not affect any of the nearby containers because all of the user land dependencies are shipped with the application itself. Finally, it does wonders. Docker, paired with Docker Content Trust, does a bunch of stuff in terms of simplifying the software compliance process. You have trusted delivery where all the content is signed. You know that the image that's in your registry is exactly the image that's running out in production, and all the containers have been signed and verified as they were rolled out. And we now have a workflow that enables both the development and operations teams to succeed at the patching process. So let me talk a little bit on slide 11 about what we think that process looks like. There's a few teams involved and there's a few important steps involved. But I just want to kind of uh, take a little bit of time to discuss what this workflow looks like and kind of our recommended workflow. The right place to start is with a secure base image. In the same way that you want to build a house on top of a strong foundation, any building for that matter, you want to build your container images on top of a secure base image. So how do you get that secure base image? Well, in many organizations, this looks like an IT operations team will set up a central repository and generate a known good blessed base image. Um, some of the things they put in there are the, the common libraries and frameworks that they know everyone in the organization may need to use, um, some common utilities, uh, whatever the case may be for their organization, they build that base image and then do two very important things with it. The first thing is to scan it for vulnerabilities. 
So this is the image that everyone else is going to be built, built on top of. You want to make sure that that image is completely secure. In addition, once the IT operations folks have decided on what that base image should be, have scanned it, they then sign that image. And when they sign that image, that's essentially them blessing that image and saying, this is the strong base image that we want everyone else to use, and we want to develop a, a trust relationship with this to say, hey, I put my stamp of approval on this base image. Once the IT operations folks can do that, the development teams go ahead and consume that image. So they consume that image to build secure apps. And their workflow looks very similar to the IT operations folks, except they're building on top of something that's already known to be good. But they're adding their own libraries, their own frameworks. So let's say you have a, a secure base image. On top of that, you add your application code um, that may or may not have a vulnerability in one of the libraries that it's using. So if it has a, a, a vulnerability in one of the libraries that it's using, Docker security scanning will see that once the image has been passed up to the Docker cloud. Because of the notification framework that the developers are able to use here, you have a very positive feedback loop that happens between the developers and the Docker registry. And what that basically looks like is with the ability to know if the application that you just uploaded may have some images, you kind of get your own agency in order to update that image and get it clean before you try to have it rolled out. So um, the, the integration here is pretty key because it integrates development teams into the security process for organizations. In addition, uh, the developers can also be part of that signing process where they were, will sign and bless those images before they're uploaded into the registry. So imagine a, a, a development team has gone through the process of adding their first party code, validating that it's free vulnerability, and then signing it. They can move on to the deployment phase for that application. So this is where the IT operations folks get involved. The, Developer developed an application, shipped it up to the registry. IP operations folks will pull down that image into the Docker hosts who are configured to only trust that image if it's been signed by a developer. And uh, then the, the application rolls out and starts serving traffic. Everything's happy. It's been scanned, then verified the signature, and everyone is happy. But the next phase of this is new vulnerabilities may be disclosed in some of the applications. So on slide 14, we talk a little bit about this. This is where we get to proactive risk management. Docker security scanning maintains a feed of all the CVE databases. And what it's able to do is when a new CVE is found, disclosed, Docker security scanning will cross-reference that against the build materials that it's created and kept for all of the images that are in the in the registry may have been deployed out in the production. And what it's able to do is email a notification to the development teams and to the IT operations folks to say, hey, we got a vulnerability in this image, we need to consider patching it. So that looks like what's happening on slide 15. On slide 15, you see that that iterative process of scanning and remediating, scanning and remediating, scanning and remediating, it started again for the, the, the folks responsible for where the vulnerability is found in that image. There's two possibilities here that are pretty interesting in terms of patching. The, the first one is a vulnerability may have been found in an application library that a um, developer may have used. So let's say it's a vulnerability in um, some Java library that they're depending on. They update their image, see that it's clean, roll it out, deploy that into production. The new version is rolled out. The old vulnerable version is taken out of rotation and spun down, and now the, the patch has been applied. So 
that's kind of the default workflow. But some, a somewhat more interesting workflow is what if that is a vulnerability, what if there's a vulnerability found in the base image? There's a vulnerability found in the base image. There's a lot of automation that is possible. And this is, this is a key ability of Docker and its um, reuse of image layers. If a base layer or one of the higher up layers has been found to have a vulnerability, what you can do is automatically rebuild all of the dependent images, run those through CI, and automatically patch those images. Um, once, they, once they pass CI, pass scanning, they're signed and then rolled out. So you really get to something that's pretty close to automated security vulnerability patching, where all the dependent images can be updated, run through CI, and rolled out. We, we expect many organizations will be able to do this, and it will cause them a huge amount of um, reduction in their time to patch for security vulnerabilities. In addition, kind of as a, um, a side note tie-in to Docker Content Trust, one of the really cool properties of Docker Content Trust is that images that are signed have this property called freshness. So what we mean by freshness guarantee in terms of a signing system is not only is the image cryptographically verifiable, but it's cryptographically ver verifiable to be the most up-to-date version. So we can prevent rollbacks or replays of old data that may have once been considered valid, but no longer is valid because what you actually want is the most up-to-date version. This hugely, this is hugely important when you're talking about updating because of security vulnerabilities. The old versions may well have been vulnerable to, say, heart bleed. The new, but they were signed and valid. And in many cases, in many signing systems that exist today, the hosts that are verifying those signatures would verify those signatures pull down those images and say, great, this is good. In Docker Content Trust, that won't happen because only the most up-to-date images will be trusted. So there's not a chance to roll back to a previously vulnerable version of the software. We think this is something where it's, it's really important to tie security scanning with Docker Content Trust to make sure that not only you're getting the most up-to-date, signed, verified version of the image. Moving on to slide 16 and kind of wrapping up before we ask questions. Hope I've shown some folks how Docker can do a good job of securing the software supply chain for your organizations. Um, we talked a little bit about the secure platform and how we have a bunch of isolation and containment primitives available with default policies across all of those. And the Docker bench tool allows you to um, assess the security of those hosts where you're running Docker. Secure content, we have now Docker Content Trust and security scanning, which together allow you to sign and verify content to know who created it and whether it's most up-to-date, and security scanning, which allows you to know what's in the container, are there vulnerable components, and have a patch workflow to make sure you're up-to-date on that. And of course, we'll continue to focus on secure access where folks can make sure they integrate well with their existing Active Directory, LDAP, or other authorization mechanisms. With that, I've finished the content that I have for today, and I'm happy to take any questions we have from listeners. All right, so it looks like the first question is, can we isolate a Docker instance from another one? This is a good question. Um, a lot of our um, work over the past year and a half, and maybe even, maybe even two or three years, um, has been around increasing the isolation that you can get from the Linux kernel. 
And what you're going to see it do on every single platform is take every isolation feature that's available on a platform and integrate good defaults for that. So in terms of resource consumption, Docker's use of things like C groups on Linux can very much constrain what one container is able to do on a host. So it's only able to use a certain percentage of the memory consumption, certain percentage of the network bandwidth, CPU, et cetera. So using C groups, Docker is definitely able to isolate one application from another. In addition to that kind of isolation, things like SecComp, SE Linux, AppArmor, constrain what the application can do so that it's only able to do things within its container and is not able to, um, say, access other files on the host or use syscalls that you shouldn't be using. All right. Um, next question is, can an application user see other Docker files? Um, there's a – Docker files are available on the Docker Hub. So when it, in many cases, when you're pulling down an image, um, users will upload their Docker files so you can see them. There are a lot of Docker files available on GitHub if you're looking for kind of example versions. Um, so that there's many there's many Docker files available uh, to kind of allow you to get inspiration if you're looking to see what other how other folks are writing the Docker files, kind of Docker file best practices, et cetera. Uh, all right. Can we have a trusted Docker Hub specific to an organization? Um, so I think the I think the question is there is can can I have my own Docker Hub? And um, looking at that, one thing you might want to consider is the Docker Data Center product set. Docker Data Center allows you to uh, install a Docker registry and have um, access control to that registry and access to, say, something like Universal Control Plane, which allows you to orchestrate and run those applications. Um, that's, a, that's an on-premise service that we offer for folks. Um, does the new Docker Bench script work with Docker version 1.10? Uh, yes, it does. Docker Bench will work um, on any version of Docker. Um, some of the more up-to-date recommendations won't be as relevant because um, we'll provide recommendations on features that aren't available. But, uh, yeah, Docker, Docker Bench works kind of across the board no matter what the Docker version is that you're writing. Um, do we need to upload our images to Docker Cloud to do security scanning? Today, yes. Docker security scanning is integrated into the Docker Cloud product set. Eventually, we'll be rolling out so that it's available in Docker Data Center, which is our on-prem offering. Is there a binary scan happening too? Yes, there is. We are scanning not only the, the files and looking at things like file hashes, we're actually opening up those files and looking into the file itself to see if there is vulnerable software. In some cases, just to give an example of something we'll do, we'll take a, a statically compiled binary, say Nginx, that has OpenSSL statically compiled in it, and we'll find that OpenSSL is within that Nginx binary. Um, thanks for a great presentation. Can you comment on network level security enhancement while the Docker image is running? So there's a lot going on with Lib Network in terms of creating um, overlay networks where networks are allowed to basically create networks and within that network across hosts, the only images or excuse me, only containers within those networks are able to communicate with each other. So uh, there's a lot going on there in terms of lib network. Uh, lib network has been within Docker for a while and it continues to evolve. I would I would say go ahead and look into look, look into lib network to to read more about what we're doing in terms of network level security enhancements. Can you give a percent of official repos that you discovered needed patching? Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a funny question. Which which percent of official repos needed patching? Um, 
and there's been some, some good writing on this, a lot of the official images are based on a point in time version of a particular Linux user land distribution, say Ubuntu or um, CentOS or whatever it is, or Alpine, when you use Docker's tagging mechanism, for a lot of those repos, what people are doing is tagging a point in time version of the repository. And so, of course, vulnerable software is going to come up because that was like a release of software. When in a lot of official images, tags are used as releases. And so, many of those contain vulnerable software just because that's the nature of ship software. You don't want to update old released versions because people may be depending on exactly that version. Um, so quite a quite a number did because they were they were based on some of those versions that were in the past. What we've seen with Docker Security Scanning being integrated is that the uh, kind of the enablement that's coming from having security scanning available is folks are starting to look at what base images they're basing on and say, hey, look, maybe I could base on a different base image because I know a particular image has more uh, more hygiene in terms of securities, security vulnerabilities, and security management. And so we're, we're pretty excited to just make this data available, kind of be transparent, and allow maintainers of the official images or other images on Docker Hub um, do a better job of keeping their software up to date. So that transparency, we think, is going to provide a lot of security for a lot of the ecosystem. How to get auditing, for example, syslog inside the container. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do in terms of logging and auditing of containers. Um, some things I might recommend is um, Docker has a mechanism for logging drivers. And a lot of folks have implemented logging drivers that allow you to get information out of the container. So looking into that might be a, an interesting area. I know syslog in particular, a lot of folks use that and want to get their application logs out of syslog and into some other system. Uh, there's a, a bunch of stuff that allows you to do that. Um, one of the interesting ones in terms of like very low-level auditing that a lot of folks are finding useful is SysDig. SysDig is a container-aware um, system profile that allows you to know exactly what the container is doing. A lot, a lot of folks are having um, good, good experiences with using that that system. Can Docker user and host user be different with access control? Absolutely. Um, so with our recent rollout of authorization plugins and authentication mechanisms, you can you can write an authorization plugin that is able to, on a fine-grained basis, say what the user can and can't do on the Docker daemon, separate from um, user level, Linux user level um, access control. Um, okay, next question is, are there any plans or timeline for allowing per container Linux namespacing? Uh, for example, run container as um, X host user instead of globally at the daemon level. Oh, um, right. So right now, um, user namespacing is at the, the level of uh, a daemon setting that does a remap or root. Um, in terms of Going one step beyond that, um, we don't have an exact timeline. A lot of the Docker engine has been written for allowing arbitrary mapping, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of plumbing within the Docker engine that that will be used to support arbitrary user mapping instead of just remapping root remapping the root user itself. Um, but no exact timeline yet on, yet on when that will roll out. A lot of what we're trying to do there is figure out a good usable interface for mapping those users and how mapping those users will play with something like volume management um, so that we can make sure that the remapped users are able to read the files that they're interested in. Okay. Are all public Docker images and Docker Hub scanned? 
Uh, right now, the official images are scanned, and any private repos will be scanned. Later this year, through, through the rest of this year, you'll see us roll out Dr. Security scanning to the public images as well on Hub. And will the scanned results be shown in Docker Hub? Absolutely, for the, for the official images and any of the private repos that you're scanning, you'll, able, you'll be able to see those images. Uh, in terms of the public images, whether you'll be able to see the scan results of other people's public images, I don't know. Um, we, haven't, we haven't decided yet, um, so stay tuned on that one. Um, okay, next question. What role does Docker play in resolving dependencies while installing tools? Um, so Docker really helps a lot here in terms of um, helping resolve dependencies. And a lot of what that looks like is that you specify your dependencies in your Docker file itself. And then when the Docker file gets built using Docker build, those dependencies get wrapped into the image. And then that image can be moved around and should run with all these dependencies, no matter if you're running on your laptop or in staging or in production or in development environments, uh, wherever. So that notion of packaging dependencies along with applications is something that Docker enables and really helps folks make their applications more, port more portable. Um, which distributions are supported for Docker security scanning? Is Alpine Linux supported? Um, so the cool thing about the way we build Docker security scanning is that um, it's distribution agnostic. In fact, it's, it's operating system agnostic. So we we have support for Windows containers. As, as soon as those roll out and become more popular, we'll already have support for those because the approach we've taken is bottom-up binary analysis rather than top-down distribution specific. Um, so Alpine Linux is, is supported out of the box. Um, running even Docker images that aren't based on any distro Say, if you're just using from scratch, uh, we can also support that. So we really support anything you can do with a Docker file that is supported by Docker Security Scan. Um, next question is, is Docker are Docker images secure from DDoS attacks? Um, this is a good question. A lot of cases, um, DDoS attacks must be mitigated by the application themselves rather than by putting them inside Docker. So Docker can't really help with um, DDoS of your applications. Um, in many cases, that's application-specific logic that needs to be built into your application, or um, kind of at the network infrastructure layer ahead of Docker. So we don't we don't address that as much um, as say other other folks, such as um, DDoS providers who provide the network infrastructure or libraries and query application to help you out with that. That's all the questions I'm seeing right now. I'm going to scroll down and see if there's uh, any other questions. Um, looks like that's all we've got for today. Um, and just want to say thanks. Um, look, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I'm on, I'm on Twitter, and um, my, my email address is available. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, thanks for the um, taking the time to join our webinar today. Um, look forward to meeting you at DocCon if any of you are there. All right, thanks so much.